Hello, little symbols. This is Jake's symbol. I know that you love these scary story readings, and it has been a while since I've done them, though they are my favorite to do. Tonight, I'm going to be reading a whole bunch of very short, but very spooky, creepy pasta. These are classics. In my opinion, the short ones are better. They're more vague. They leave a lot to the imagination. Before I begin, if you're new here, I do a lot of these. I have a playlist of all of them, and I will be doing many more, and I recommend that you subscribe. I have another one actually coming. Should be in the next few weeks. That will be a collaboration. Okay. I'm gonna get right into it. These scare me a lot. This first one is called The Railroad. My cousin and I had gone to San Antonio, and we heard rumors of some haunted railroad tracks. The story was a school bus full of children had stalled on these tracks with a train coming. The train was going too fast for there to be time to get the children off, so they all died. When we finally found the tracks, we stopped the car, parking it right on the railroad tracks. We were both a little nervous and scared and waiting for something to happen. Just when we were about to leave, the car started rolling. We were both too freaked out to do any more than grab each other and gasp, eyes wide, mouths open. After what seemed like an eternity, but was actually less than five minutes stops, the car stopped rolling. We looked around, and we were off the railroad tracks. Now, that may not seem spooky, but what we saw next scared us enough to jump back in the car and make the six-hour trip home that night. Both of us got out of the car and walked around to the back. After the first six-hour drive, our car had accumulated quite a bit of dust on it. That's not scary, no. But what was scary was the little sets of handprints all over the back of the car, all the size of children's hands. next story is called A Mother's Love. A Mother's Love. One afternoon, a couple was traveling on by car when at a far distance they saw a woman in the middle of the road, waving frantically. The wife told her husband to keep on driving because it might be too dangerous, but the husband decided to pass by slowly so he wouldn't stay with the doubt on his mind of what might have happened and the chances of anyone being hurt. As they got closer, they noticed a woman with cuts and bruises on her face as well as on her arms. They then decided to stop and see if they could be of any help. The cut and bruised woman was begging for help, telling them that she had been in a car accident and that her husband and son, a newborn baby, were still inside the car, which was in a deep ditch. She told them that the husband was already dead, but that her baby 
seemed still to be alive. The husband that was traveling decided to get down and try to rescue the baby, and he asked the her woman to stay with his wife inside the car. When he got down, he noticed two people in the front seats of the car, but he didn't pay any attention to it and took out the baby quickly and got up to take the baby to its mother. When he got up, he didn't see the mother anywhere, so he asked his wife where she had gone. She told him that the woman followed him back to the crashed car when the husband went back to look for her. He noticed that clearly the couple in the front seats were dead, one of whom was unmistakably the woman who had flagged them down. This next one, this one gets me. I'm so, uh, these scare me so much. Uh, these scare me more than any creepy boss. I'm doing this for you. I'm alone in my room. Completely alone, okay. Sarah O'Bannon. Coffins used to be built with holes in them, attached to six feet of copper tubing and a bell. The tubing would allow air for victims buried under the mistaken impression they were dead. In a certain small town, Harold, the local gravedigger, upon hearing a bell one night, went to see if it was children pretending to be spirits. Sometimes it was also the wind. This time, it wasn't either. A voice from below begged and pleaded to be unburied. Are you Sarah O'Bannon? Harold asked. Yes, the muffled voice asserted. You were born on September 17th, 1827. Yes. The gravestone here says you died on February 20th, 1857. No, I'm alive. It was a mistake. Dig me up. Set me free. Sorry about this, ma'am, Harold said, stepping on the bell to silence it and plugging up the copper tube with dirt. But this is August. Whatever you are down there, you sure as hell ain't alive no more, and you ain't coming up. I just kept getting goosebumps throughout that whole story. Thank God that's over. The Tundra. The native villagers around these parts say that there's a stretch of tundra just north of here that is occupied, occupied by benevolent spirits. These spirits grant insight and warning Whoever visits them at night, once the sun has disappeared entirely and left the world in jet darkness. I drove out to the middle of the frozen expanse of ice and waited, hoping to catch a glimpse of whatever commanded these people's reverence. They sent their children out, bundled in furs to keep from freezing. On the eve of their fifteenth birthday, to seek an audience with these spirits. Once they have achieved this, the children run home to their parents to share the news. From then on, these children are considered adults in the village. Engaged couples visit this tundra on the night before their wedding. The entire village stays up all night, awaiting their return, 
as it is upon their return that the couple either decides to proceed with their marriage or to abandon it. The elderly visit the tundra whenever they are sick or ailing and often make their condition worse by staying all night in the cold. When they return, however, it is most often with an air of sheer serenity. So I waited, curious to see what phenomenon might inspire people so powerfully. I waited for hours, bundled in my parka and sitting on the hood of my pickup. I waited until I felt that I was going to freeze to death, even in my thick clothing. I heard the spirit before I saw it, a crunching of snow in the silence made me jump off my truck and spin around. A hunched, gray-skinned man stood a few meters away. Sad, yellowed eyes stared back at me, set inside a skull from which sprouted only a few greasy hairs. He breathed heavily, with a rattle that shook his fragile ribcage and one of his arms looked as if it had been messily broken and then neglected, allowing it to knit back together imperfectly. Badly scarred flesh marred his splayed legs. The man stared at me for perhaps ten seconds, breathing in the frigid air and exhaling a sickly dribble of steam before disappearing when I blinked my eyes. I spun around, looking for the man, but he was truly gone. Approaching where he had stood, I found a pair of bloody footprints in the snow. Frantic with fear, I got into my pickup and headed for the village as fast as the ice would allow. A few villagers were waiting for me when I arrived, knowing that I had gone out and curious as to what might happen. I hastily got out of my truck and, approaching the nearest villager, I demanded, what is so benevolent about these spirits? What is so insightful? How do these spirits help you? What did you see? he asked, the look on his face now mirroring the fear in mine. I saw a man, horribly disfigured and desperately sick. I screamed into his face, and the rest of the villagers around us backed away a step. Why? What does that mean? I begged him. The spirits show only one thing, the man explained. They show their visitors. A year into the future. I had actually never read that one before, but that was good. This one is called Wristbands. This one's very scary. When you are admitted to a hospital, they place on your wrist a white wristband with your name on it. But there are other different colored wristbands which symbolize other things. The red wristbands are placed on dead people. There was one surgeon who worked a night shift in a school hospital. He had just finished an operation and was on his way down to the basement. He entered the elevator and there was just one other person there. He casually chatted with the woman while the elevator descended. When the elevator door opened, another woman was about to enter when the doctor slammed the close button and punched the button to the highest floor. Surprised, the woman reprimanded the doctor for being rude and asked why he didn't let the other woman in. The doctor said, 
that was the woman I just operated on. She died while I was doing the operation. Didn't you see the red wristband she was wearing? The woman smiled, raised her arm, and said, Something like this. I forgot about the twist ending. More goosebumps. Ooh, goosebumps. Okay. This one is called The Other Watcher. A man went to a hotel and walked up to the front desk to check in. The woman at the desk gave him his key and told him that on the way to his room, there was a door with no number that was locked, and no one was allowed in there. She explained that it was a storeroom and that it was out of bounds. She reminded him of this several times before allowing him upstairs. So he followed the instructions of the woman at the front desk, going straight to his room and going to bed. However, the insistence of the woman had piqued his curiosity. So the next night, he walked down the hall to the door and tried the handle. Sure enough, it was locked. He bent down and looked through the wide keyhole. Cold air passed through it, chilling his eye. What he saw was a hotel bedroom like his, and in the corner was a woman whose skin was incredibly pale. She was leaning her head against the wall, facing away from the door. He stared in confusion for a while. Was this a celebrity? The owner's daughter? He almost knocked on the door out of curiosity, but decided not to. As he was still looking, the woman turned sharply and he jumped back from the door, hoping she would not suspect he had been spying on her. He crept away from the door and walked back to his room. The next day, he returned to the door and looked through the wide keyhole. This time, all he saw was redness. He couldn't make anything out besides a distinct red color, unmoving. Perhaps the inhabitants of the room knew he was spying the night before and it blocked the keel with something red. He felt embarrassed that he had made the woman so uncomfortable and hoped she had not made a complaint with the woman at the front desk. At this point, he decided to consult her for more information. After some gentle quizzing, and the promise that the explanation would go no further than him, she finally said, Well, I might as well tell you the story of what happened in that room. A long time ago, a man murdered his wife in there. We find that even now, people get uncomfortable staying there. But these people were not ordinary. They were white all over, except for their eyes, which were red. That's pretty intimate. They were staring right into each other's eyes. Okay, okay. The next one is called Upstairs. When I was a child, my family moved to a big old two-floor house with big empty rooms and creaking floorboards. Oh god, this one, okay. Both my parents worked, so I was often alone when I came home from school. One early evening, when I came home, the house was still dark. I called out, Mom, Mom, and heard her sing, heard her sing song voice. 
I say yes from upstairs. I called her again as I climbed the stairs to see which room she was in, and again got the same yes reply. We were decorating at the time, and I didn't know my way around the maze of rooms, but she was in one of the far ones, right down the hall. I felt uneasy, but I figured that was only natural, so I rushed forward to see my mom, knowing that her presence would calm my fears, as a mother's presence always does. Just as I reached for the handle of the door to let myself in the room, I heard the front door downstairs open and my mother call, Sweetie, are you home? In a cheery voice. I jumped back, startled, and ran down the stairs to her. But as I glanced back from the top of the stairs, the door to the room slowly opened a crack. For a brief moment, I saw something strange in there, and I don't know what it was, but it was staring at me. This one is called Her Name. It wasn't a big deal at first, you know. It was just another story online. One you'd read in the comments of a YouTube video designed to scaring you into posting it on eight other videos. You know the kind where you die a horrible death or your crush will reject you if you don't spread the word. I didn't think anything of it at the time, but now it's the only thing I can think about. The comment started by saying that she hasn't left the poster alone in days. The poster in brackets, she hasn't left me alone in days, basically. And by reading this, she'll come for you. I don't even remember the exact wording because it was late and I was tired and I'd seen a hundred other comments like it before. I forgot all about it. Until she started coming after me. It started with little things. A flash in the corner of my vision. A strange shadow on the hallway floor. Then it got worse. I started to hear whispering when I was alone in the house. Giggling. The sound of footsteps. I now know that she was teasing me. Sort of like how a cat will clamp its paw over a mouse's tail and bat at it before it kills it. Mirrors were the worst. She liked to stand just out of frame when I was brushing my hair, so when I shifted my head to get the other side, she would be there, standing next to the bookshelf, with her long, tangled hair, matted with blood, falling down her shoulders, and that grin. Oh, God. That grin. Her teeth were always bloody. I was never sure if it was her blood or... I don't even know. Every night it seemed to get worse. I would see her on my way to class, in the rearview mirror of my car, dragging her talon-like fingernails across her own rotting flesh as I stared in abject terror. For a while I put it off to sleep deprivation. Finals, you know. And then she came to me. It was late. So late it was technically early. I couldn't sleep because all I could hear was her giggling. I covered my face 
face with the pillow and shut my eyes tight when I felt something cold in my hand. I was paralyzed with fear. It was sharp and it was cold and it was moving down my arm toward my elbow. Come out to play, she said in a lilting, upsetting voice I'd heard one too many times before. I screamed and sat up, but she was gone, for the moment. My biggest mistake was when I talked to her. I just stepped out of the shower and she was right there when I opened the curtains. I shrieked and stumbled back and she leaned down to me. Why? I asked. Why are you doing this? She told me why. It was because I knew something about her. That altercation ended with a serious head injury that landed me in the hospital. That's where I am now. I can't take this anymore. I'm just one person. It's too much. I know what I have to do. I think I always knew. God, I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. Her name is Nora. She should be there soon. And if she is there soon, she'll be here soon, too. So, um, we cannot commiserate in the comments. Nora's being extra spooky today. Man, this sucks. I'll be like... I'll start an ASMR video and be like, hey guys, Nora spit on my face in the middle of the night. <laughs> anyway, this is called The Tape. I hate this one. I mean, I love it, but I hate it. During the summer of 1983, in a quiet town near Minneapolis, Minnesota, the charred body of a woman was found inside the kitchen stove of a small farmhouse. A video camera was also found in the kitchen, standing on a tripod and pointing at the oven. No tape was found inside the camera at the time. Although the scene was originally labeled as a homicide by police, an unmarked VHS tape was later discovered at the bottom of the farm's well, which had apparently dried up earlier that year. Despite its worn condition, and the fact that it contained no audio, police were still able to view the contents of the tape. It depicted a woman recording herself in front of a video camera, seemingly using the same camera the police found in the kitchen. After positioning the camera to include both her and her kitchen stove in the image, the tape then showed her turning on the oven, opening the door, crawling inside, and then closing the door behind her. Eight minutes into the video, the oven could be seen shaking violently, after which point the thick, black smoke could be seen emanating from it. For the remaining 45 minutes of video, until the batteries in the camera died, it remained in its stationary position. To avoid disturbing the local community, police never released any information about the tape, or even the fact that it was found. Police were also not able to, to determine who put the tape in the well, or why the height and stature of the woman in the video didn't come close to matching the body they'd found in the oven. That might be one of the scariest in my opinion, the 
image, just the images. I don't even want to, I don't even want to recite the images. Next story is called The Girl in the Photograph. One school day, a boy named Tom was sitting in class and doing math. It was six more minutes until after school. As he was doing his homework, something caught his eye. His desk was next to the window, and he turned and looked to the grass outside. It looked like a picture. When school was over, he ran to the spot where he saw it. He ran fast so that no one else could grab it. He picked it up and smiled. It had a picture of the most beautiful girl he had ever seen. She had a dress with tights on and red shoes, and her hand was formed into a peace sign. She was so beautiful he wanted to meet her, so he ran all over the school and asked everyone if they knew her or have ever seen her before. But everyone he asked said no. He was devastated. When he was home, he asked his older sister if she knew the girl, but unfortunately she also said no. It was very late, so Tom walked up the stairs, placed the picture on his bedside table, and went to sleep. In the middle of the night, Tom was awakened by a tap on his window. It was like a nail tapping. He got scared. After the tapping, he heard a giggle. He saw a shadow near his window, so he got out of his bed, walked toward his window, opened it up, and followed the giggling. By the time he reached it, it was gone. The next day again, he asked his neighbors if they knew her. Everybody said, sorry, no. When his mother came home, he even asked her if she knew her. She said no. He went to his room, placed the picture on his desk, and fell asleep. Once again, he was awakened by a tapping. He took the picture and followed the giggling. He walked across the road when suddenly got hit by a car. He was dead with the picture in his hand. The driver got out of the car and tried to help him, but it was too late. Suddenly, he saw the picture and picked it up. He saw a cute girl holding up three fingers. There's like a joke version of that story that my friends and I used to tell in school. It's funny how easily you can turn this into a joke. It's a girl doing jumping jacks next to the railroad tracks going 22, 22, 22. And someone comes up and they're like, why don't you like count normal? What are you doing? And they just get so mad. And then they stand there until they get hit by a train or something. And then the girl doing jumping jacks starts counting 23, 23, 23. I really loved that joke. It's so sinister, but so, like, I don't know, goofy with the sound of the girl counting. Okay. This one I'm dreading reading. But I'm gonna do it. The statue. A few years ago, a mother and father decided they needed a break, so they wanted to head out for a night on the town. They called their most trusted babysitter. When the babysitter arrived, the two children were already fast asleep in bed, so the babysitter just got to sit around and make sure everything was okay with the children. Later that night, the babysitter got bored and went to watch 
watch TV, but she couldn't watch it downstairs because they didn't have cable downstairs. The parents didn't watch the, didn't want the children watching too much garbage. So she called them and asked them if she could watch cable in the parents' room. Of course, the parents said it was okay, but the babysitter had one final request. She asked if she could cover up the angel statue outside the bedroom window with a blanket or a cloth. At the very least, close the blinds because it made her nervous. The phone line was silent for a moment, and the father who was talking to the babysitter at the time said, Take the children and get out of the house. We will call the police. We do not have an angel statue. The police found all three of the house occupants dead within ten minutes of the call. No statue was found. The fact that it's an angel statue, something about that. There is a version of this story where it's a clown statue or dummy or something, which is also terrifying. Sound off in the comments, clown or angel, which is scarier. Okay, this next one is called Marine Drives Through Amboy. I was driving a shortcut from 29 Palms, California to Albuquerque, New Mexico. 29 Palms is located in the desolate high desert east of LA. The shortcut was all two-lane road through total nothingness, except for passing through Amboy. Amboy is a nearly abandoned town nearly as far below sea level as Death Valley. With a dormant volcano and a lava field on one side, and a salt flat on the other. It was also, at the time, a hot spot for satanic group activity. So I was driving by myself in the afternoon. I stopped in Amboy and snapped a picture of the city sign, just to prove I was there to friends who dared me to take that route to I-40. I got back in my car and proceeded to drive up into the mountain range between Amboy and I-40. Once I reach the top, I am driving north through a canyon with high grass on both sides of the road. Up ahead, I see some stuff in the middle of the road. As I approach, I slow down to see a red Pontiac Fiero stop sideways across both lanes. A suitcase open with clothes scattered everywhere and two bodies laying face down in the road, a man and a woman. I stop a hundred feet or so away and the hair on the back of my neck is standing up. Being a marine, I reach under the seat and pull out a nine millimeter pistol and chamber around. Something seemed very wrong. It looked too perfect, as if it were staged. An ambush. Was I being paranoid? Something was just wrong. Getting out of the car seemed unthinkable. So was the horror movie move. As I scanned the road, I saw a line I could drive. Past the guy in the road on his left, swerved to the right side of the woman behind the Fiero, and I'd be on the other side. I dropped it into first gear, punched it, and drove the line as I planned. I passed the back of the Fiero without hitting it or either of the bodies in the road. I continued forward a couple hundred feet and slowed down so I could breathe and let my heart slow down. As I looked up into the rearview mirror, I saw that the two bodies had gotten up to their knees and twenty or so people emerged from the tall grass on either side of the road by the car and bodies. That was me shifting in my seat. At that moment, my right foot smashed the gas pedal to the floor and did not let up until I had to slow down for the I-40 
deadly serious and asked him if he would ever leave her were she not truly beautiful. He laughed and complimented her, figuring she was simply being dramatic and wanted, be, wanted to be told how pretty she was. She then grabbed a cloth and rubbed at her face, wiping off the heavy foundation she wore and revealing a grotesque purple birthmark covering nearly her whole face. Of course he would still love her. He was a good man. But before he could stop himself, he let out a gasp. His wife burst into tears and fled, and hadn't returned by the time the honeymoon was supposed to end. She had no passport and no money, so fearing the worst, the man went to the police. The police thought it was most likely the girl simply had second thoughts about the marriage, Yet due to the fact she had no official documents and spoke no French, they launched a hunt. Nothing ever turned up. As weeks turned into months, the man finally gave up on finding his beautiful wife. When his life fell into shambles, he was so filled with grief. Unable to hold a job or go on with his life, he took to wandering the world looking for anything that might ease his pain. Years later, in Borneo, he came upon a freak show in an old, shabby building. He went in on a whim. In the last filthy cage, he saw a twisted, scarred, and mutilated woman rocking back and forth and groaning, strange animal-like noises. He screamed as he recognized the birthmark on his wife's face. The thumping is my roommates stay up really late and so do I, so they are just, uh, I think my roommate Joe is up there gaming, so don't be scared. My house is clear of any presences. I don't remember this one. This is called Leon Cholkos. I don't know how to say that, but I'm saying Cholkos. Leon Cholkos, assassin of William McKinley, the 25th president of the United States, was electrocuted for, electrocuted for his crime on October 29th, 1901 at Auburn Prison in Auburn, New York. Among the personal effects found in his cell was a U.S. quarter stamped with the date 2218. The face and profile on said quarter was not George Washington, but rather a face which has yet to be identified. Time travel. Spooky. The vanishing prophet. A man driving along a busy motorway sees a hitchhiker and stops. The hitchhiker gets in and straight away announces that the war between heaven and hell will begin soon, and heaven will lose. The way he speaks makes a deep impression, but when he says he is an angel, the driver looks round at him incredulously, and at that very moment, there is no one there. He is dissolved into thin air. The driver's surprise is immense. Startled, he pulls over to the side of the road. As he sat there, a police officer stopped to see why he was parked by the side of the road. I'm so shook up I can't drive, he told the cop. Why? What's wrong? He asked. He told the policeman what had transpired. The officer's face was pale as he told the driver that he was not the first one this has happened to this week. This is called the most important news. Who discovered the existence of the dead? Everyone, everyone knows the name of Antonia Simone but the ex 
exact circumstance of her discovery are wildly varied. In 1992, her younger brother Ricardo was injured in a martial arts accident that left him completely paralyzed. He needed a respirator to live and could only communicate through eye blinks. She was a computer scientist at the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center and decided to create a computer terminal sensitive to the slightest energy source. She was a student of curly and photography and strongly believed that the body's electromagnetic fields could affect sensitive electronic equipment. She created a terminal that could not be affected by traditional means. No keyboard, mouse, or other input devices. A veritable black box. Miss Simone was devoted to her brother and tried for years to make a computer terminal that would allow her brother to communicate naturally. Distraught over the failure of her terminal, which she thought would free thousands of similarly afflicted people, she killed herself by hanging. When paramedics found her body days later, there on a computer screen was the message, What took you guys so long? I've got the most important news. I don't even find that one scary. I think that's pretty cool. It kind of has a good ending, maybe. It sounds like, you know, she wouldn't be so happy if, you know, things weren't bad. Okay, I don't remember what this one is, but it's called Sleepover, which is never, never good news. Sleepover. A young girl had a sleepover with several of her teenage friends attending. Shortly before midnight, she told her guests that there was a grave in the edge of the woods behind her house, and anyone going there on a full moon and standing too close to the grave would be pulled into the grave by the bony hand of the old man buried there. One 15-year-old girl scoffed at the story, and after much teasing, accepted the challenge of going alone to the grave. As proof she had actually gone all the way, she was to stick a large pitchfork into the top of the grave for inspection by all the others the next morning. The girl left, and did not return. The others got scared afraid to wake the adults in the house, fearful they were in serious trouble. Next morning they all huddled together and nervously made their way to the grave. There they found their friend lying dead from exposure beside the grave, with her long nightgown pinned to the grave where she had stuck the fork through it, and into the hard clay covering the grave. Well, that sucks. I like, I, I like those uh, twist endings where it wasn't the paranormal thing that killed them. It was just like a freaky accident. Okay. Oh, this one is. Oh. The old lady. One day, at a shopping mall, in the afternoon, a woman was coming out of the mall from a shopping spree. She was in a happy mood. She had gotten to her car and loaded her stuff that she had bought into her trunk. When she was done loading, she shut the door of her trunk and she saw an old lady standing by the passenger side of her car. The old woman said, would you be a darling and give me a lift home? I don't have a car and was walking all day. The woman said, I'd be happy to. So she unlocked the door for the old woman. As she started to make her way around the car to the driver's side, she started to feel uncomfortable. So when 
she got in the car, she looked in her purse and said, Darn, I can't find my credit card. I'm going inside to see if anybody found it. The old woman said, I'll wait for you here. The woman left to go look for help. Then she found a security guard and told him the situation. They went back to the woman's car and the passenger door was wide open. On the seat of the car was a shopping bag that the old woman had been carrying. Inside of the bag was the old woman's dress and a gray-haired wig, along with a huge butcher's knife, a video camera, and a roll of duct tape. Okay, I'm gonna end there for tonight, because my computer is dying. I got through most of the scary stories. I hope that they spooked you enough. Let me know what you think in the comments. And do you want to see more of these? I know enough of that you do that I'm going to be doing more of these regularly. And I'm probably going to make us, now that I'm like getting closer to my goals, I'm going to probably make a schedule for what I'm going to upload when, and I'll probably do a regular uh, scary story series, you know, at a certain frequency so that you're fed. Uh, again, please don't forget to subscribe, it really helps me, and uh, you know, leave a like if this is good, and let's talk in the comments, I always like to connect with people, I love spooky stuff. I will definitely take requests if you have any favorite creepy pasta. You know, comment below. Thanks for all your support and everything. This is Jake Simple ASMR. Remember that like ghosts aren't real and, and all that stuff. Just go to bed. Um there are no dolls um in my room that will hurt you. I don't own a